Origins are a difficult thing to describe, particularly origins that antecede the existence of space and time. But one cannot build a castle on sand, and so if we intend to understand the history of our realm, we must establish its first principles. The best descriptions for this premium S offered to us are as an ethereal sea, not quite substance and not quite void, which was constituted of the undirected, unaspected proto-ether. There are many theories regarding how our world's metaphysical condition forms from this state, and although I am no less fallible than anyone else, and the origins of our world are only approachable to us in metaphor and metonym, I mean to present here the account which I believe to be the most sound. Existence is a term that we might consider once concentrations of this ether begin to crystallize. This is the first dualism. A piece of the premium est has peeled off and in so doing given birth to difference. This difference requires space, at least conceptually, to designate the boundary between this and that, but there is not yet anything quite like substance as we understand, so the ether flows freely through and around that which is crystallized and the crystal reflects itself against the sea. This first spark immediately gives birth to all other dualism, here and there, light and dark, having cast a reflection against the sea which constituted the first moment of primitive consciousness, the crystal cast a reflection of itself. It is a fool's work to try and establish which crystal was the original in a timeless era, but whether they have since grown a distinct or independent substance, I believe that Heidelin and Zodiac are in essence a reflection of one another. This first consciousness, this first idea, was also an idea of space, and although it was so far removed from the structure of our contemporary ideas and thoughts to be nigh impossible for a mortal mind to understand, we all know that ideas directed at a large concentration of ether will give form. And so it was that Althic, keeper of space, change, and time, was born. The crystal acted as a conduit for the ether, and from its point would issue the first expressions of substance, that is to say, a concentration of ether was given form within the formless sea and the latter would envelop it as a kind of soft veil. The first substance to issue from the crystal propagated itself as a kind of crystalline basin. Once it was formed, there was a moment of stasis, and now there had been two static moments with an intermediary of change. And as the crystal reflected this change, it gave birth to Nemea, the goddess of that which was to be at the end of a movement, the spinner of fate. This crystalline basin filled with ether which poured from the crystal and having established this realm of substance, the ether could not long remain formless and so it became water. Although the entire realm was to be an extension of Hydaelyn and would continue to expand many times over, Althic and Nemea recognized this place as the point of contact with the crystal and so far the only point where the ether could flow through the crystal and penetrate the world. Understanding that it would be essential to the growth and health of their young world, they created the first and greatest of dragons, Midgard Zorla, to forever defend the sacred Silver Tear Falls. There are other accounts by which the Void and the Ethereal Sea are equivalent. Eidolon molds the world out of the Void, but residual ether forms substance and some resemblance of life in the Void, including the first and greatest Zodiac, whom wish to destroy life and creation and return the ether to its primeval stasis. However, I would testify that any part of the Ethereal Sea in which physical substance forms is no longer constituent of it and requires a different category. Even if the Void is fractured and inconsistent, it is still distinct from the ether it is a reflection of Heidelin, and the raw ether serves as a membrane between the two. My conception of Zodiac is also essentially nihilistic. As Heidelin reaches one way, Zodiac reaches the other. Every expression of creation by Heidelin produces an impulse for destruction within the void, and each side of the crystal in a natural state will move to balance the other. There are few, however, that are satisfied by a natural state. The Twelve are intelligent creatures born of the light and the creative ether of Heidelin. Even Ralga destroys only to prepare for new creation. Intelligence born of the light wills for the light to grow and for the dark to recede and fade. Whether or not there are among them equivalent reflections of the Twelve, we know the Asians to be one intelligent force of the Void that similarly wishes for imbalance 
to see every expression of the crystal consumed by Zodiac. While the substance of the void does also constitute creation, the creations of this dark ether despair in existence of any kind, and the Asians only use substance, including their own, as a means by which they might enable Zodiac to consume Hyluin before destroying itself and returning everything to the quiet proto-ether. So although if left alone, the light and dark would continue to sit in balance, the children of the light will not suffer death, and the children of the dark will not suffer life. From this hypothesis, we might consider the entire history of Eorzea, and indeed of Hydaelyn, as a struggle between light and dark, A civilization reaches a point of constructive power which can so easily be expressed destructively. The patient Asians take advantage of this power and coerce the mortal races into damaging their own realm to the point where they might weaken or cripple the crystal, or otherwise allow an expression of Zodiac to find substance in Hydaelyn and bring about the mutual destruction of all. These calamities have so far proved to eventually lose traction as the denizens of light have pushed back, ever stubborn to regain balance before building momentum to spread the creative light to yet another plateau. This theory is not written in stone, but we have seen enough umbral calamities brought about by the powers of the Void influencing the Allegans, the Amdapori, the Garleans, and their current movements amongst the Ishgardians to posit this as the primary agent for the cycle of the ages. In any case, we know Silvertear Falls to be the center and origin of all water and magic, and our scholars tell us that the first surrounding land which germinated, now known as Eorzea, was for a long time the physical home of the first beings of light, gods and goddesses of great power that would come to be known by mortal races as the Twelve, and that comparatively lesser beings that may have served as the genesis of our ideas of the primals likely walked among them. In the next installment, we will cover some account for the time of the Twelve and what we know currently of the first umbral and astral eras, as well as the first use and forms of magic in its structural intricacies. I expect that the little we absolutely know of the history of the realm will expand massively with the release of Heaven's Ward and all of its supporting material, and you, you can be sure that I'll be releasing content covering and analyzing all of it, supplementing and challenging ideas that I've already expressed on the channel. So if you enjoyed this video and you're excited for everything that Heaven's Ward will bring, please subscribe, share it with your friends, follow me on Twitter. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you're looking forward to the next installment, but for now, I'm Ethis, and this is a metaphysical history of Eorzea.